I can remember there's some nuns that live right behind us down there. And one nun came by one night and he's out there with uh, cotton gloves on shooting free throws in the snow. And the nun came up and says, he's going to be slump someday. People were always telling him he was too small to do this, too small to do that. So I'm sure that, was a, that had a galvanizing effect on him. A tough guy to compete against, a guy who uh, never backed down, a pro's pro. Just goes to show you when you have God-given ability, you put it to the maximum of use, you work hard every day, other great things can happen. John Stockton sends the Utah Jazz to the NBA Finals. The thing that's amazing about John Stockton, uh, you know, Michael Jordan and all the guys started the, the long shorts. John Stockton is the only player, I think, in NBA history who has not adjusted his shorts. And he doesn't care. Hi everybody and welcome to what we're calling Primetime Stockton. It's a two-hour tribute to John Stockton as we get ready for tomorrow night's retirement of number 12 in the Delta Center. And you want to talk about the all-star panel I have them tonight. To my immediate right, Larry Miller, owner of the Utah Jazz. In the middle, Frank Layden, who was uh, John's first coach and of course a longtime friend. And on the end, the duo, the other half of the duo, Carl Malone. And uh, we're going to tell some stories, or these guys are going to tell some stories in the next 45 minutes that you may have not heard and probably haven't about John, and then try and seek absolution a little bit later. Uh, guys, I want to start with Carl, because Carl was the one who met John before anybody else, and you actually met him at the Olympic tryouts. Give me a reaction. Was there an immediate bond, and now the statute of limitations is over, so you don't have to lie anymore? Uh, well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> we won't stretch it. Uh, we won't lie, so we'll tell the truth. <laughs> I just remember uh, the Olympic trials was the hardest thing I've ever been a part of in basketball. And I didn't think basketball should be that hard. And uh, they had a thing in the lunchroom. If your name was on the board when you was picking up your tray, that meant you was cut. And so, of course, we made the first day. And all these guys knew each other, so they were just surrounding uh, each table. And there was one table left in the middle of this lunchroom with I don't know how many athletes. And Stock came from one direction and sit at a table at the same table and I came from another direction and sit at a table. That's the first time we ever met in our life. Hi, I'm John Stockton. Hi, I'm Carl Malone. And we ate, where you from? Spokane, Washington, Sunfield, Louisiana. Where's that at? And that's how we that's how we met. And from there it just oh, I think the rest is history. They shared a table and shared a career, too. That's a yeah. pretty, good, pretty good start. Yeah. Now, Frank, when John came to the Jazz after he was drafted, and a lot of people didn't know who he was, first training camp didn't go real smoothly, didn't go real swimmingly, because a lot of people don't know that John thought what was being offered might not have been adequate. Well, I was pretty good at threatening the uh, poor kids who I thought were going to be backup players, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, it's a, the amazing thing about John was how many people take credit for him. You know, uh, actually the first person ever mentioned John Stockton to me was Neil McCarthy at Weber State. Then later on it was Liddell Anderson, and of course uh, then Jack Gardner saw him in the college all-star game. I kind of looked at him and thought he was awful small, and we already had a great point guard in, uh, in Ricky Green. So it, whether we signed him or not, I really didn't care. Um, I, I think my attitude would be different today. For some reason, I was protecting that money like it was mine. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I, I was, I, you know, we weren't trying to sign Dantley for a hundred thousand. Know, now it would be a hundred million, I guess. But, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it, we were probably within fifty thousand dollars or something of signing him. And uh, he was cocky and he was tough, and his father was that way too. I says, Well, listen, you better get another stick behind the bar there because that's where he's going to be working. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talked about his cockiness. This is, this is early, uh, John reflecting on his early times of how uh, his reaction when he first got to camp and he got a chance to play against these guys. I went into camp and I remembered uh, knowing who everybody was and. and uh, Strangely enough, I remember calling, calling an old coach at home and saying, hey, they're not that good. That shouldn't surprise anybody on this set <laughs> that he know, had that attitude. But, you know, one of the funny things is, is, is the older players are playing tricks on them all the time. 
You know, they knew he was this little uh, Catholic school boy, you know, so they were telling him that, oh, Coach Layden requires you to dress to go to the practices and the games. He'd show up on the bus with a tie on the shirt, and then they'd fool him to sit in my seat up front, you know, and I'd go along with it and really get after him. But uh, he was naive. He might have been a little cocky there like, 20 <laughs> years later. But uh, I don't care. When they get to training camp, they're all nervous, even like the big guy. And I want to just say this, and Larry, you can you agree with me. How do we win so many games? We had two guys that have been cut. Huh? <laughs> I mean, I think it must have been great ownership and great coaching. I figure I spent a lot of nights pondering that. <laughs> what about when you, Larry? You came on the scene. John was already here, but where did you see him fitting in what was going on by the time you got involved with the Jazz? And what was your impression of the guy? Not necessarily professionally, but on a personal plane. Well, John was a guy that I could relate to right away because he he uh, was not yet starting, and and uh, we just struck up a, a relationship just like any two people would. Uh, but it, he was right at the transition point in his career when uh, he, was, he was moving Ricky Green out. And Ricky, re, Ricky realized it, and it was really hard for, for Ricky to do that. And John was so good out there, he was taking more and more time. And, and uh, by my second year, he was, he was a starting point guard. I can remember uh, coming into camp and seeing things he was doing. I was like, God, that's... I used to think my point guard was good. I said, God, he's good. But Ricky was, like Coach said, Ricky Green was good. And all of us was nervous. And I'll admit this. I think out of everybody that I ever played with, I took stock for granted the most because I knew every single game what he was going to bring to the table. And I just expected it. That's why after the game, an interview came and they said, oh, God, what do you, th what do you thought about John Stockton? I was like, well, he's supposed to do it. But now when you look back, and I think everybody here is say, when you look back at it now, he, it's a dying breed. Of, uh, my, my high school coach used to say, make your teammate better than you are. And when I got here, I realized uh, what, what he said there. Coming up next, a side of John that most of us didn't get to see, plus a look back at his incredible record-setting career. I can remember when John was a rookie in sec first and second year, my wife used to get in our old Oldsmobile station wagon. If we drove over here about six blocks and pointed the, the car toward Salt Lake City, we could get a hot rod. And uh, he'd fade in and fade out, and we'd sit out there in that car, just tickled to death to be able to listen to it, because the jazz were never broadcast up here. Welcome back, everybody. Hot Rod's been fading in and fading out ever since. Jack thought it was a radio problem. <laughs> I don't think it was. Welcome back to our primetime Stockton, uh, along with Larry Miller, Frank Layden, and Carl Malone. Guys, we talk about John Stockton. He is a product of his family. Uh, there's no question about that. Frank, you talked a few minutes ago about Jack thinking that John was pretty good and he ought to get a decent contract as well. Some of those character traits... Uh, the apple definitely doesn't fall very far from the tree. And I know one of them, the intensity factor of John Stockton. Everybody who meets him talks about that. And I know you've all three had experience with that. Uh, Mel, I want to go to you first, okay, because uh, you probably experienced it more than anybody on a night-in and night-out basis. A guy who still apparently gets in fights at pickup games, if we can believe what we hear in Spokane, Washington. Well, the thing about Stock, and, and I have to go back to Coach and Larry, one of the if not the toughest per, uh, player I ever played with. Uh, literally, guy used to, when he, he used to set picks for me, and I felt bad. I knew the ball was coming to me. Every single time he would set a pick, in every game, I would say, God, stop, be careful. And he looked like, what, you know? And then after the game, his shoulder would be literally swollen. And I just remember a time in training camp where he was going after a loose ball, and of course, I hit Stock thinking it was somebody else who was picking on Stock doing, doing the practice, another guard, because we, you know, had our little thing, and it was Stock. So I hit the wrong guy, and <laughs> Stock just brushed it off. Like, well, I, I knew what you meant to do, but he was, he was like one of the toughest guys that I've ever played with. And uh, I miss him, not just from a basketball standpoint, by what he represented as a professional athlete. And I think that's what we're missing to, in, in our game today, is being a real professional, coming into camp in shape. He used to, I used to train in Arkansas. And I knew it was an hour earlier in Spokane. And some days I didn't want to. And I said, I, 
bet you he's training. Well, we get to training camp, go through our physical. We want to see who body fat was the lowest and all that. When we really got into it, not, not our first couple of years. And he used to say the same thing. God, I bet he's on that treadmill, that Stairmaster. So we competed all the time. But it was just a joy to play with a guy like that. And I'm sure coaching him and uh, uh, Larry owning the team, knowing every single night, every single day what you was going to get out of a guy. And nowadays you don't know all the time. And it was just a joy for me. What characteristic of John, if I asked you, Larry, and you, Frank, would you say, if, if you had to use one character trait of him, what's the one thing you remember? Would it be intensity? Would it be work ethic? What would it be? It was te integrity. You know, I think what he did, uh, and Carl uh, alluded to this, is that he gave you an honest day's work. I, I think Larry would feel the same way. As a coach, you knew what you were going to get. And, and, and you don't mind paying for that, by the way. You know, either an extra work or, or whether it's money, because you know that he's earning it. And I think that uh, both uh, John and Carl set the, the bar for what the Jazz were for 20 years. I, get, uh, I used to get asked when I'd speak a lot to define John Stockton in one word. And the word uh, that I thought of right then and in the years since then that I've, I couldn't think of a better single word and it's thoroughbred. Just whatever he did, he just, he was so single-minded, so single in purpose. And uh, a lot of people didn't understand that, but if <clears throat> you, you look at how he was as a basketball player, and it, you could beat John Stockton, but he would never, ever give it to you. And, and you had to be pretty darn good to beat him and catch him on a bad night. So, so it, and as Carl said, you, you almost got to take it for granted because he was there with it every night. And with Carl and John both, they might have better stats one night than another night, but it was never because they weren't trying. And I can live with that. If you were 20 points behind or 25 points behind with four minutes to go and you wanted to put another guard in, he was mad at you. <laughs> he thought that we could still win or close the gap. Yeah. And if you were 25 points ahead and you don't want to embarrass the other coach and the other team, all right, and you want to get the backup men some experience, he'd be mad at you. <laughs> I mean, he competed for a whole game, yep. and he wanted to play, you know, all, all 48 minutes. There's a side of John that, unless you've been around him, people wouldn't normally associate with him, and that is his sense of humor. My memory stock is every time we played in Canada, he was singing the national anthem after the game. <laughs> that was his thing on the way to the airport. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of funny. But wow, you know, I, like I said, I, I, I took him for granted for so long, and you miss him so much uh, as, as a human being, as a person, and what he brought to the game because that is when basketball was basketball. Uh, Larry, from, from your standpoint, when you talk, uh, you think about John, loyalty is also one of those things that, that with both Carl and John, when you look at the length of time, uh, that they spent with a team. And it's more than just just pure time, isn't it, as far as definitions of loyalty, especially in the sports world these days? Well, absolutely. And, and let me tell you what's interesting is, is the loyalty was so deeply ingrained in him that it's still, even though now he's been retired, this is his second season without playing, it's still that way uh, for, this, uh, for the upcoming Jersey retirement. Uh, he has asked me when I, because nobody wants to call him and say, John, would you be at this press conference? Would you do this? Would you speak at this thing? And he, and his question to me is, do I have to? And I said, John, you don't have to do anything. He says, if you ask me, I have to. And it's, it's really an interesting uh, characteristic how, and, and he's that same way with his dad. He's that way with Carl. And it just, uh, it, 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 he said, would you please call Frank personally and make sure he comes to these events? Would you please call Carl personally? The loyalty with him is lifelong. When we come back, I want to talk about chemistry, and we talk about it a lot with basketball teams and people, and there has never been more chemistry, I don't think, between two players ever. For nearly two decades, uh, they called them the dynamic duo. They performed amazing plays on the court. When we come back, we'll take a look at some of John and Carl's greatest moments. And then Carl Malone just keeps running. The shortest guy in the court, John Stockton, gets the rebound. One bounce and no left hand in the ball over the top. Nothing Jordan can do. Carl Malone, the best running big man in the game, just keeps it going. Pounds by everybody. Stockton, normally so stolen. He says, yeah. <laughs> Russell will inbound at half court. Uh -oh. Stockton, open three. Utah Jazz to the NBA Finals. 
that was so many things all wrapped up into one. It was, it was our first chance to go to the championship. It was really the first time we'd been able to beat Houston at anything or, or they just year after year, we kept running those guys in the playoffs and, and to finally get over that hump. That was, I think, a, a snapshot of John Stockton that we have never seen before. I think other than the night that uh, he was honored at the Delta Center, the most emotional we've ever seen him. Welcome back to Primetime Stockton. And Larry, uh, you watched that again, I saw, with great, yeah. uh, great detail, attention to detail. Yep, and I got to tell you <clears throat> what happened in that play. And if you, <laughs> now if you can see it again, uh, it, <clears throat> it would mean even more. But at the timeout, the coaches are overdoing their thing, and Carl says, hang on. <laughs> He says, let me tell you what we ought to do. He says, Stockton, I guarantee you, you will be open. Now, and, so and that they, pick they made went to Stockton. Now, they called a pick, okay? He didn't pick Drexler. He grabbed Drexler. Drexler wasn't going anywhere all night. <laughs> and, and he didn't get called for it because they were watching Stock. And then yeah. the infamous Bill Walton, uh-oh. uh-oh. <laughs> and he drilled it. That, was, that had to be one of the great moments in jazz history. I, I was going to come to you about that because so many people miss the pick, which is the reason the whole thing worked. And as Larry said, it really wasn't a pick. It was, it was like fourth and one, and you stopped the running back. Well, it, it's, it's like in a, in a game like that, that I, I think one of the all-time greatest games, you force a referee to make a call. Make, make him make an offensive foul call. And not a lot of them would do it. So I had it in my mind that if it's any time <laughs> that they're going to do it, which who knows what would have happened, I said, you know what, Stock? I said, you're going to be open. He looked at me, he said, okay. And Coach Sloan looked and just sat down like, you guys go on and do what you want to do. And I went out there, and it's like that's the only thing that came to my mind is not just say bear hugging, but hold him and, and see what happened. And when Stock was so open, when the ball left his hand, I knew it was in. It's just one of those things. So it was like, man, it was unbelievable. So. Most memorable play in your career? Oh, yes. By four, that play right there. And he had a lot of them, but just that play right there. And I think that's the most excited I've ever seen John. And, and for the things he did in the game to get us to that point and to hit the shot, it's like I started jumping up before the ball even went in, seemed like, and man, it, was just, it was just unbelievable. But a competitor, I don't know if it was at his size. This guy was 178 pounds when he was in top shape. I beg to differ, but that's what he said he was, and he argued with me all the time about it. But it's like some of the some of the hits he took in the game for me, and people need to go back and realize half of those points I wouldn't have got unless I wide open under the basket. But just just the intensity and what he brought to the game was just I don't know, it's just unbelievable. That play started a ball rolling, literally. Um, you came home. There were ten thousand people at the airport. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Right. You remember that night, I am sure. It's never happened since. Uh, who knows if it'll ever happen again, but it certainly had never happened before. All right. I just remember when we came in, and the plane normally just come right up, and they kind of, for this particular time, he stopped out there. That's when I think all of us realized the magnitude of we was going to the finals. And when we stepped off the plane to see the fans and forever and then out on the street and it's like unbelievable but I remember that like it was uh, yesterday and we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier it was so easy for me to get ready to play here the John Stockton and the Jeff Horner sack when you leave you see how hard it is to get ready to play the game and with these guys here and with Stockton a true professional uh the way he prepared himself to get ready to play, that's lost now. Uh, I knew he was going to put on his sock. He was going to tie his shoe a couple of times because we sit right beside each other. It's like when we went on a road trip, the all the other team managers thought that we was inseparable. So they put us right beside each other all the time. So when we didn't like that place, me and him both, he would move mine or I would move his stuff. And it was just, it was just a bond there. That, and we never talked about it. You know, that's, that's the most amazing thing about it. It's like when I got a rebound, I could turn and literally throw it to a spot, and I just knew he was there. When I came off a pick and I just had just a little crease, the ball was right there, and we never talked about it, and that's what made it so great playing with John Stockton. 
Of course, the career, uh, there was another finals appearance in 1998, um, and then the career wound down. And as we all know, uh, John retired in Sacramento, basically, because that was the last appearance on the floor. Um, can we go back, and I'd like all three of you to go back as what went through your mind. Larry, maybe I can start with you because uh, as an owner, you probably had a pretty good sense that that was it. Well, uh, he had been talking about it, and clearly it was, uh, it was coming time to do it. I wasn't sure he'd, he'd uh, retire at the end of that year, but I, I figured it was better than a 50-50 chance. And I guess the biggest thing uh, for me was both the personal and on behalf of the franchise, the void that he would leave. I mean, how do you measure what he's done for the franchise? How do you measure the space he filled up in, in people's lives in, the, in terms of what he was for the franchise? I mean, and, and he's, with Carl or with John, there's just, it is immeasurable, but, it's, it was, I, but the neat thing, Steve, was about five years before he retired, I said to Gail, you know what? John's career is winding down, and I'm just going to sit back night after night and watch him and enjoy him. So I was able to do that knowing that it wasn't a forever thing and appreciate him a little more. A standing ovation here at Arco Arena for Stockton and Malone. We may never see this guy on the basketball court again. What is going through their minds at this time? Talk to me a little bit about what the, the announcer asked. I wonder what's going through those two guys' mind. Take me back to the bench when you came out of that game in the, uh, in the loss against Sacramento. You know, but you don't want to accept it. Uh, whether he told me or not, that's besides the point. It's just that I didn't want to accept it. Maybe he told me, and I just didn't want to believe it. <laughs> Maybe he was telling me. <laughs> but uh, God, it, it wasn't just a, a basketball player. It was like uh, I came here from Louisiana here, and, I, and, I, and we meet. And it's like a, a, well, he was older than me, but it was like a little brother that you felt like you got to protect all the time, and he was a little brother that I got to protect my big brother all the time. But our, our talk on the plane was a talk that I'll never forget because it's the first time really he opened up to me on everything and he was thinking and vice versa. And, uh, you know, and I say it now, and Larry's here and everybody's watching, That's the first time that I realized that I didn't want to play here without him. So, you know, it's the first time I've ever mentioned that. Everybody read into it like they wanted to, but I, I just couldn't see myself lacing them up in a jazz uniform without number 12. And, and I think that speaks volumes. It's not about what this was said and how this was said. It's just that that void was there that I couldn't give them everything I had here because he wasn't there. And that's, I think, to me personally, uh, that's the ultimate compliment of what I think about it. And, Larry, that speaks to the legacy of these two guys. And they, they will be reunited again, uh, not in, uh, at least not in the flesh, but certainly uh, in the future they will be reunited uh, visually in front of the Delta Center as, as part of the that legacy. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we were working on that yesterday. So uh, getting the design and the footings where the bronzes are going and stuff, and and clearly they're <clears throat> they're joined at the hip in uh, NBA basketball and and even more jazz basketball history for forever. This is part of that project uh, that has been an ongoing project for Larry. How long? Uh, inception a couple of years ago, yeah, basically after the announcement. Yep, that's exactly right. We've been working on it almost two years now, and he's. Uh, He's being cast in bronze, probably as we speak, and uh, Carl's uh, work is coming along. He's a few months, a year or so behind in uh, the, well, the we artist. Came in, we came in a year late, so. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, you're looking a little thin in that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, you've got to work on that a little bit. I was pretty thin when I came to the league. They gave me an opportunity to play, but I was pretty thin yeah, but as well. But. Yeah, that's the artist Brian Chalice right there, and that's in his studio at his home, and it's uh, really taken nice shape. and. Looks a lot like John, and will be done in three or four different sizes in bronze. They'll get you a little more ripped before it comes out. <laughs> yeah, okay. before it comes out, it'll, yeah, it'll get me right. But no, no, I had a, like I said, I, I think Larry was saying earlier how much more time we got. I think we can go on and on. Then I said, Larry, he owned the station, so he can go as long as he wants. That's to, right? exactly right. But it's just so many things that stop uh, bring to the table. And it's like when he left, that's when people really start to appreciate 
what he was. I had an opportunity to play somewhere else. And boy, did I appreciate and didn't take it for granted like I did for all of those years. And, and you get to see that. And Coach said it earlier. You get to see a different part of it. And uh, I admit that I did. But I also appreciate the year we played together because I loved in the fourth quarter, with two or three minutes to go, we up or down by one. And Coach Sloan said, pick and roll until they stop it. Boy, I, it just, <laughs> I just loved it. It was just, it was just man, one of those things I'll never forget the rest of my life. Let's talk about Monday night in the Delta Center. Carl, you kinda, you've kind of been through an emotional night in the Delta Center. Uh, John has as well. You, you handle those a little bit better than John as far as being more comfortable. It is not going to be John's thing, we know, Larry, on Monday night. Uh, and yet he has said again that, that he will do this. Um, and I'm sure when he gets there, he probably will enjoy it a lot more than he thinks when, the, uh, when he's looking at it now as something in the future. Talk to me a little bit about uh, Monday night. Well, <clears throat> you're right. He, it's an interesting thing with him because it goes against his nature, being in the limelight and so on. But, but he knows uh, that this is for the fans. He knows that it's for he and his family. <clears throat> and he says, uh, how long do I have to speak? And I says, well, the good news is it's halftime, so, <laughs> so you won't have long. You know, you'll probably have 30 seconds, maybe 60, so pick your words carefully. And, of course, Nada and the family and his parents will be out there with him. It'll be a special night, uh, but it'll, be, it'll come and go pretty quick. But it's been a hard sellout for a long time, and by that I mean standing rooms, suites, everything are, uh, are all sold. Uh, and it'll be an emotional night as it was when we had the John Stockton Day a year ago, June. But uh, it's, it's, it excites me on one hand for, for him and for the franchise, but it also saddens me because it'll probably be the last major event where he is a jazz player honored by, by the fans and the franchise. Uh, there are some great stories that take you behind the scenes. Frank, I'll, I'll go to well, you first. Well, I'll tell you, uh, his father, Jack, is a, is a competitor. He's a tough guy. You know, he's a little tough Irishman. And, and uh, of course, his uh, father-in-law, you know, Nader's dad, former governor of Alaska, and I always call him the governor, Governor Stepovich. They invited me to go up and to have dinner with them and, and uh, to play some golf over Coeur d'Alene, which is nearby uh, Spokane. So I go with them, and, uh, of course, the Coeur d'Alene golf course is very classy. Of course, like a... Hundred and eighty dollars or something to play golf, and but that's okay. I mean, you know, it's something special, and you know, when you play like me, you get every penny's worth of that hundred and eighty dollars. But but anyway, so we go up there, and the guy says, uh, "I say I put a credit card." Yeah, I put the credit card down. He takes it, boom, you know. And Mr. Governor Stepovich steps up, boom, takes his card. Jack steps up, boom, he takes his card. All right, and John steps up, and the guy, the guy looks and goes, "Huh, huh? You're John Stockton." Hey, John, well, oh, I can't charge you. Jack, Jack Stockton jumps in. What do you mean you can't charge him? He said, he makes four million a year. I'm a bartender. This guy's retired. What do you mean? He says, if you can't charge him, who the hell can you charge? Yeah. <laughs> and the guy goes, oh, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. He rips up the slip so we played a free round of golf. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's probably one of the few times that you played free on John because we know he is very uh, frugal. He's not going to worry about it when he retires with his money, right? Right. Oh no, he won't worry about it <laughs> no. at all. <laughs> one of, one of the stories I got is his toughness. Uh, uh, we was a uh, tournament of Americas and we was in uh, Portland, Oregon, and he did some to his leg where his leg actually wouldn't bend back out. And it would always flare up every now and then, every once or two years. Actually, where well, the bone will pop out. So we had training camp in uh, in Chicago, and we stretching. <laughs> so the the coach from Miami, the 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 trainer from Miami, as we, as we were stretching, ready to get up, stock couldn't get up. So he looked over at me and say, "So of course I knew what it was." So he called the trainer over. And he said, look, you need to pull on this really hard, and it'll pop back in. Well, this guy here wanted no liability at all. <laughs> so I watched as he did it himself. Yeah. And, and when I say toughness, and I think Larry and Frank say the same thing, you know, it was, he shouldn't have played a number of games. And he was hurt sometimes so bad 
that I wouldn't even get eye contact with him in the game. I'd just say, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I'm ready, I'm ready to play. And I'm knowing he's not. And then he'd go, in the game, he'd go out there and do what he'd do. Uh, and I, what else can you say about the guy? He's just uh, unbelievable. And it will never, ever be another one. And I'll go on record and say that. It will never be another John Stockton ever. After they finish this statue, we're going to throw away the mold. <laughs> <You're all right. laughs> He's probably going to break it anyway. <laughs> he might as well. <laughs> might Larry. well break it. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I have to say, you know, when he talks about playing a lot of nights, he shouldn't. I've, I've often thought if there was a way to know did Carl motivate John or John to motivate Carl in that respect? Because, because Carl played a lot of nights he shouldn't have. John played a lot of nights. And, and with both of them, I'd say, you know, are you because we've never asked players to play when we thought it would hurt them later in their life. And, you know, they got to walk on those legs and use those arms. And, and both of them have the same answer. It doesn't matter. They just play through it. I, and and it was, it's so a toughness. But a couple of fun things about his competitiveness and so on. When, when John would come into training camp, they have to go out and have an extensive physical, and they, they had uh, uh, body fat tests in the buoyancy and stuff. And we like players to be in the seven to eight percent range. And that's w where their joints can get lubricated properly and so on, and and uh, seven to eight percent body fat. So, so uh, generally that's where most players are. We had a couple that were, you know, struggling getting down to fifteen in their contracts. <laughs> I won't mention any names. Had to do with uh, uh, one of Carl's comments one summer, <clears throat> and. Uh, <laughs> Fat something or others, I can't remember, and, and so on. But uh, I shouldn't get off on tangents here, right? <laughs> but uh, well, I remember that they would come in and they would be uh, so lean and, and, and Carl's uh, <clears throat> uh, and John's last season together, we were at a practice and we were standing there and they're in sweats and, and I was there and Jerry's talking to all the players and there's like, what, 25 guys still in camp and, and I said, uh, how did your uh, body fat test go today? You know, I'm standing next to Carl and John, and Jerry's talking, so we want to be careful not to interrupt him because he doesn't like that, uh, even from me. And I try to respect him uh, that way. And Carl says, 2.7. <clears throat> and, and I looked at him, I said, really? And he says, yeah, and John kind of saunters up, just like who, me? He just saunters up real quietly and says, 2.4. <laughs> and, 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 when, and if you talk to Russ Shields, who's one of the team doctors, he'd say every year when John comes in and goes to do the treadmill test, he says, what's the record? And every year he breaks his own record. And I mean, that's just how he is. And, and he said to me, do you know what John's heart rate is, standing heart rate? And I said, I have no idea. And he's, he said, do you know what your own is? And I said, no. And he says, well, if you were really healthy, your standing heart rate would be 62 to 67. And if you were in unusually good shape, it might be the high 50s. I said, okay. He says, John's standing heart rate, and he was, I think, 38 years old, 30, is 36. And I said, 36? I can't even relate to that. He says, yeah, sometimes we have to check him and see if he's dead. And, uh, and I said, tell me, in lay terms, tell me something about that. He says, he can recover his win. He doesn't have to sit on the bench and take the time. He can recover while somebody's shooting free throws at the free throw line. And that's why we see sometimes he doesn't seem like he's sweating and stuff that much. He just, but that's because of how he takes care of himself. And, and so I think both of them motivated each other, Carl and John, both fed off of each other and and make each other great players. I remember, I remember doing, the, doing practice or a game. It could be something serious going on. He'll, he'll come over by me and do like this. Uh, Dang, can you believe I'm sweating? You know? <laughs> he used to do stuff like that, you know. You know, like, yeah, because I would sweat all the time. He was like, can you believe I'm sweating? I wasn't plenty of sweating that day, you know. So that was just his nature. And, I, you know, to, to play with a guy that you know was in shape, it motivated me. I'm serious. We had a, a a standing little debate going on. Who was training? Oh God, it's 7:30. I know Stockton is working out. I better work out. And if he did, I'll work out later. But like I said, it, it's going to be a wonderful moment. I think uh, uh, in, in the Delta Center, and every single applaud he get, he should, and more. I think people will finally will realize now what really was and what he was like and it won't be another one. One of the things I was thinking about last night when I was thinking about coming over here today and is uh, what if there was no John Stockton and there was no Carl Malone and certainly they weren't together. I think they would have been great, great players, but as a, as a duo it was certainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, Marino to whoever it was and, you know. Coach, I know. 
But uh, you well, know, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think I think they would have been great. But there wouldn't have been any Delta Center. Yeah. There would have been a housing project there, and we would have been talking probably to the Minnesota Jazz. <laughs> There'd be no Larry Miller. Oh, there would Larry Miller would, you know. Probably own the Yankees or something, but that's. <laughs> but, but really, you know, <laughs> I think I think the acquiring of uh, of John Stockton began the uh, legitimacy of of the Jazz, and, and and it coincides with the also the purchase of the team by Larry Miller, that, that they were going to be here forever, and uh, Carl Malone. Well, I noticed you took a shot at John being older than you. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I know it's a little gray in that beard too. Right? Yeah. Well, if I let it grow out, it'll be a lot more. Oh, trust me. <laughs> Only sixteen months. Only sixteen months. Yeah. And Larry is an owner. Uh, I mean, to have two of the fifty greatest of all time, and to have two that you've got one going up in the rafters on Monday, and the other one won't be far behind. Um, it has to be, even though it's an evolutionary process as an owner of a, of a franchise, this has got to be a, a great time for you. Well, it really is. And I, I know that it's a, a great time in history, for, uh, as you said, for me and my family, but, but more for the, for the franchise and for the fans, for just for all of us. It's, and there won't be any other time like it. Uh, I, I'm glad that I was able to appreciate the years. I, and I do want to say, Steve, that uh, it's, it's really special. And I want John, or I, I'm sorry, I want Carl and Frank both to know that it was that John made me promise and swear to, to make sure that these two would be here uh, for this, for this show, and for the events that will go on uh, during the weekend to honor John and, and how special they both are to the franchise. And uh, thank you. I told John that <clears throat> since he uh, haven't came to see his uh, goddaughter, Katie, bring I see him. will bring her to see bring him. him. There you so go. he get to see her. <laughs> Does that surprise you that he hasn't been down there uh, yet? Absolutely no, not. But I'll tell you what, uh, when I lost my mom in August, I had no idea he would be there. We got, I got four calls every single day. And little did I know when I walked in, just like John would do, um, 100 degrees, I walk in with my brothers and sisters and something said, look to the left, not down, but up. And I looked up and who did I see? In El Dorado, Arkansas. Now it is, takes some effort to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and John and Nader was there, but that's the only way he was wanted. And as, as he left, people were like, man, that was John Stockton. And I'm looking like, yeah, <laughs> that was John. <laughs> so, but that's how he wanted it to be. So. Hey, thanks, guys. Stay where you are because there is much more ahead on primetime Stockton. Up next is Stealing Time, Passing History, the revealing documentary on the life and career of the jazz great. That first aired days after John announced his retirement. So sit back, enjoy. That's coming up next. The Utah Jazz select John Stockton of Gonzaga University. He did it! John Stockton, a new NBA assist king. The crowd going crazy. John Stockton sends the Utah John Stockton, Stealing Time, Passing History. On May 2nd, 2003, John Stockton uttered the words, I think I'm finished. It's time for me to move on. And just like that, the 41-year-old passed on playing another season, promptly ending an improbable 19-year career in the NBA, all of them with the Utah Jazz. John is the ultimate gym rat. And he's not doing it for the paycheck, he's doing it for the love of the game. He is tenacious, he, he, he has a problem with losing. I have heard him defined as the kind of guy who has to beat his five-year-old kid in ping pong, 15 zip every game. Anything he does, he does well. It's one of those guys, every team wants a guy like John Stockton. You never know the guy was a superstar, the way he carries himself, and I like that. He's very unimposing. When you meet John Stockton, he's like somebody's little brother. He's never looked like a basketball player, but the shorty shorts, I know he used to hate this. I used to call him John Boy, because he reminded me of, in that uh, TV series, uh, uh, of the Waltons. I remember my uh, rookie year, and uh, actually seeing him at the NBA All-Star game, and I had played against him already. However, when you see him, he doesn't look like a basketball player. So he's walking through the hotel and he had a suit on. He looks like an insurance salesman. 
And then the second time I see him later on, he says, hey, Kenny, how you doing? And I look, I thought it was a fan because of his size and his stature. But on the court, you know who he is, you know what he does, and he does it better than anyone who's ever done it at the point guard position. He's something special. Uh, I, I think of him as, as the point guard. Perfection. When you talk about point guard, uh, the classic point guard that's John Stockton. John Stockton is a professional basketball player. And when I say that, I mean that he is the guy who you would want your son to play basketball like. Well, he's the best point guard of all time. I mean, not only what he's been able to do at the peak of his career, but how he's been able to play with such consistency and longevity, it's amazing. I used to have a coach that always say, make your teammate an all-star, all-pro. And that's what he tried to do every night. Stockton retired as the NBA's all-time leader in steals and assists. He led the league in assists an astounding nine straight seasons. Seven of those years, he totaled more than 1,000. His 15,806 career mark is nearly 6,000 more than Mark Jackson, who's number two on that list. The main thing about a point guard is he looks to dish before he looks to swish. Well, that's the heart and soul of his game because I associate that with the way the point guard position is played. You know, John comes over half court thinking, how am I going to set something up for one of the other four guys, rather than thinking, what am I going to do for myself? You can't teach what John Stockton can see on the court under pressure. He not only can see everybody, but he remembers where they are. Taking a, a visual picture of where the guys are on the floor, not having to look at a guy to make a play. Well, he can anticipate when guys are going to be open. And that's a, that's a sign of a great passer that can know when a guy is going to be open, know where he likes it, and deliver it there. He picks you apart. Those are right by through traffic. Three guys are the defense never sees the ball coming. It's right to the guy for a layup. I'm absolutely unbelievable, marvelous. When you watch players cut when Stockton has the ball, they've always got their hands up and their eyes on the ball because you never know when he's going to let it go. Stockton puts under this big one. Hands up. He sees an opening and he's going to fire it at you. And of course, that's where the, the old saying, know your customer, comes from uh, because, uh, you know, some guys uh, needed uh, room service passes, as we called them. Uh, you know, like come over and hand the ball to you because uh, you're not ready to catch it. He's the all time assist leader in steals. And, uh, you know, people don't really talk about the steals as much as the assists, but, you know, he plays both sides of the court and uh, that's what makes him a complete player. For him to hold both records is a, a, an incredible achievement and uh, those two records will probably be uh, there for a long time. His instincts as an offensive player, he converted those to defense and he saw the passes before they were thrown. He anticipated what he would do, and so when the opponent did it, bingo, he had the ball and off he went. He's a good defender because he gets over those screens and picks with a lot of gusto. He doesn't allow guys to pick him off, and then if he has a mismatch, he doesn't allow a taller player to try to post him inside. So he's working diligently and relentlessly to get inside to stop the play. He doesn't go out there and, and, and play around with the game. He's very serious about it. He's a smart basketball player. You know, everybody say he's dirty, but I, I think that's wrong. I think that's that's not a statement for him. I think that they should just understand he goes out and play basketball the way he knows how to play hard. I tell people all the time, this to me has been like the greatest era of basketball. I got a chance to play against Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan. And you put John Stockton right in that group. John Houston Stockton was born March 26, 1962 in Spokane, Washington, where he grew up the third youngest of four children to Jack and Clementine Stockton. Irish suburban Catholic, three words, that's it right in this neighborhood. My dad was born and raised in a house three blocks from the house he currently lives in and, and uh, we've all been around that little neighborhood our entire lives. And it was not a wealthy, wealthy neighborhood. And so families worked hard and they worked together. And I think John has that in him from his family and from his neighborhood. John's father ran Jack and Dan's, a popular tavern that's a stone's throw away from the Stockton household. When Jack wasn't pouring pints, he was helping raise a tight-knit family. Things were handled at the appropriate time. Uh, we, we didn't, he didn't sweat the small stuff. Mom's always been solid as a rock and, and uh, again, when you have good parameters and 
fair parents. Uh, it, it sure seemed easy growing up. During John's adolescent years, he was close to his sisters, Stacy and Leanne, but it was older brother Steve that John had the strongest bond. As for my brother and I, we competed, const I competed constantly. I, I think that uh, I'm four years younger than him and it was never very difficult for him to beat me at anything. I spent most of my life just hoping to beat him once at something. I didn't care what it was. Even if, it, if I could grow an inch taller than him or uh, throw one strike past him, anything, and I would have been pleased. If he and Steve mowed the lawn together, they'd figure out a way to compete while they're mowing the lawn. It would become a game to them. And they were that way at shoveling the walks, pacing off and see who could clear how much snow uh, the quickest. The competition between the two grew more fierce on the family driveway, playing the game they loved. The backboard was attached to aluminum patio roof, so it was noisy. I mean, it bang, bang, bang constantly. Every night that was, we'd have dinner and they'd go out and shoot hoops. There were a lot of moments of bloody lips, um, uh, pretty rugged battles that my parents seemed to ignore. The games in the driveway were uh, a lot of fun. Uh, they were a lot of fun for me early. If I tried too hard to to stop him, then I'd just get pushed into the fence or knocked down, and he'd hold the ball above his head, and I'd jump for it, and he'd just kind of tease me. When John and Steve played, there were no rules. They, they, they were their own referees, and everything was subject of debate, let's put it that way. The only rule was there were no rules, and uh, if you made a bucket going to the hoop, you earned it and deserved it. <laughs> they were pretty nasty. Can't go left without getting airmailed into the... Uh, the wood fence and we had the convent next door uh, you know and there's been a couple times that the sisters over there had to shut the windows due to due to some profanity and I remember coming in crying a couple times and and uh, my mom wouldn't even stop stop washing a dish she'd just say well if uh, if he's too big don't play with him and uh, then I'd run out in the living room and see if dad would do the same thing and, and uh, he said don't go play with those big kids if they're too tough for you and a few minutes later I was out there pestering them again trying to play John's ambitious nature didn't go unnoticed at St. Aloysius Elementary School, where he excelled on the court and in the classroom. We'd have these mental drills, you know, where you'd say add this number and subtract and multiply and divide, and what's your answer, you know, just in their heads. And he, his hand would shoot up every time, and he was always right. With anything, you have to have a leader, and I do distinctly remember John being that leader on the floor. You know, when the ball was in his hands, it was like, you know, there were, there were no worries. John was a fierce, fierce competitor as a small, like 11, 12-year-old kid. John wasn't as good as a lot of the fellows we played in terms of, like, the left-handed lay-in, the, the three-point jump shot. But when you walk out of the gym, John's holding the trophy. Not a great shooter, but an adequate shooter. Um, not a great driver. He certainly didn't develop his passing until he, um, he gained a little bit more size. But... Uh, really uh, just an overachiever because of his heart. He's always obviously talented and um, you know he's smart enough to know that uh, when he went out and played with older people or, or guys a little better than he was at that time to make sure he got the ball to the right people and uh, you know so he picked that up real early. When I was with kids my own age they were bigger and stronger and better. Uh, a great teammate uh, that uh, that I emulated as much as anybody else, Steve Brown from uh, sixth grade through high school and just having him on the team raising that bar constantly every day. John raised his own bar after school one day at an unlikely place. The biggest thrill he ever gave me he was in a grade school uh, track meet and they were having an all-city meet and I know he never trained for it. He ran the mile. They had a big guy that was uh, he was it in the mile here. John was putting along behind him the whole thing and then he, he buried the guy. And it was the biggest thrill, because I didn't even know he could run the mile. And he broke the, he broke the city record by 15 seconds. After St. Al's, John dashed off to Gonzaga Prep, where his talents continued to flourish. Great shortstop in terms of range, had a remarkable range. Uh, and eventually played varsity for me his junior year. And uh, hit about 280, 290, getting good range. Uh, double play, handled that very, very well. Good arm. Most people probably don't know this. He's probably the only kid in Bronco baseball to have a perfect game, yet he couldn't break a pane of glass with a fastball. <laughs> he just threw nothing but strikes. John wasn't the biggest guy going. He was a little guy. Uh, he had turned out for both quarterback and he wanted to play in the secondary. He never let size get in his way. 
He was very tough. He hit as hard as anyone on the team. Football could have been John's best sport. You know, I think that John in today's college era would have been a, a, a terrific option quarterback. First impression uh, of John, uh, just uh, a skinny, uh, small kid, uh, not ready to play. You know, look like a junior high player. Uh, they laugh about uh, the priests here uh, would give him a key so he could get into the gym, and he always had, uh, you know, a game going on. And it's not unrealistic to think that he would spend five to six hours playing hoop, whether it be in a facility or outside shooting around or bouncing the ball in his room. Or I mean, he was he he lived for it. It was it was really what made him tick. He did a lot of stuff on his own, like dribbling in the basement in the dark. I, I can remember there's some nuns that live right behind us down there. And one nun came by one night, and he's out there with uh, cotton gloves on shooting free throws in the snow. And the nun came up and says, he's going to be something someday. John's hard work paid off by his sophomore season at Gonzaga Prep, when he earned a starting spot on the varsity team. Stockton wasn't flashy, but incredibly efficient. I yelled at uh, at him and I said, hey, can't you be creative a little once in a while? He mumbled and, and uh, next time down, he throws a behind the back bounce pass to a guy for in stride to, for a layup. And as he runs back, back by me, he says, is that creative enough, coach? <laughs> Stockton continued to amaze the next couple of years and by his senior season, John averaged 23 points per contest and had 17 steals in one game. But the five foot 10 inch 145 pound point guard had few college suitors. When the time came, there were only two or three Division I teams that recruited me. John visited us, he visited uh, Montana, he visited Idaho with Don Munson, who really wanted him, and he visited Seattle Pacific. Carroll College was interested. I think that Montana was interested. And uh, when Gonzaga showed some interest, it was great for John because he wanted to play in his own backyard. Once I went on the first recruiting trip, I pretty much knew I didn't want to leave home. And uh, the, the decision was simple. I'd grown up on campus at Gonzaga. It didn't seem that appealing, but uh, uh, it was perfect. He committed on uh, Easter Sunday. He called my house and he said, Coach Fitz, uh, I'm going to go to Montana. And my heart just dropped because by that time, you know, we felt strongly about him and felt we had to have him. And then he said, when you guys go over and play him, <laughs> in typical John fashion. John would spend the next four years at the university where he grew up in the shadows of. It was the same place where his grandfather, Houston Stockton, was an All-America football player in the 1920s. During John's first year at GU, he met Nada Stepovich, a volleyball player and daughter of the last territorial governor of Alaska. We met when we were at Gonzaga as freshmen. He actually had a class with my twin sister. Laura, and um, he came over to borrow her notes. And so that's when I, the first time I met him. It worked out fine. She had a boyfriend already, so. <laughs> that same year, John also made an indelible impression on DePaul's legendary coach, Ray Meyer. What's the deal with the guy with the freckles on his butt? And, and I said, Ray, there's days in practice. And I said, I know this is nuts, but I said, there's days in practice that I think he's faster with the ball. Uh, than without it. It was with the ball that John worked wonders and in his final season was named first team West Coast Athletic Conference after averaging 21 points and seven assists per game. Numbers that would merit a tryout for the 1984 Olympic team. Just being invited to the Olympic team was was probably the most exciting individual thing that had happened to me athletically. The, the, uh, the invite to the United States Olympic team, uh, it was awesome. At the trials, that was something in my back of my mind that I kind of felt, you know, is he going to faint? You know, is he going to get in there and go, ooh, ooh, wait a minute, that's Michael Jordan, or that's Patrick Ewing, who were the names then, or boy, he didn't even blink. What a learning experience that was. Talent there was phenomenal, and yet it g gave me some confidence that, that uh, maybe I could play against him. The first time I met John was we both got cut from the Olympic team uh, in 84. We rode to the airport together. It was kind of weird because it was me, uh, Carl Malone, uh, Terry Porter, and you think like, wow, and then you see how his career turned out.
I did get a degree in business. I, I, that uh, again goes back to you better take care of the, the necessities and uh, never ever in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be playing professional basketball. Actually the person who first mentioned them to me was uh, uh, Fran McCarthy, for the coach of Weber State. And this fellow had said, he said, I, we, we saw this guard who's just terrific. You ought to look at him, he's something special. And I was a projected fourth or fifth round pick during my season at Gonzaga. And so I, again, I was just looking for a possibility of a tryout. And then one thing happened after another. And all of a sudden comes draft day, and I, I've heard that maybe, maybe a possibility late in the first round or second round. So. Because of that, we all watched the TV that day. A bunch of people came over to the house. Utah's turn came. I said, watch out for Utah. The Utah Jazz select John Stockton of Gonzaga University. Hearing that on the TV set, I just walked out in the other room. I didn't, I didn't really quite know how to act. I, it was uh, a surprise, and, and, and yet it was uh, a challenge. It was a lot of things. I think people didn't know who he was, so there was shock and surprise. And I have, to, I have to say this, I was not fully convinced it was the right thing to do. And we drafted him primarily as a backup to Ricky Green, who uh, was an all-star point guard and, and, and quite a great player in his own rights. I'd like to say that I'm very excited at the possibility of playing with the Utah Jazz. They're looking for a point guard to back up Ricky Green. He was an all-star player last year. Before John could join the Jazz, he first had to sign with them. Well, he held out a little bit. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, he had a lot of confidence in himself, and uh, there was a, he had a lot of moxie. And uh, we tried to sign him for the absolute minimum. And I even threatened him one time and told him, okay, I told his agent, that uh, uh, you better get him a, uh, a road map and, a, and an apple because uh, he's going to be, he's gonna be over uh, playing in Italy or uh, Greece or something. He's not going to be playing in the NBA. The two sides eventually agreed to terms, and John signed a contract worth $80,000, $5,000 more than the league minimum. After that, it was time for the fresh-faced rookie to hit the hardwood. We thought he had some physical talent, uh, but we didn't know what was in here, and we didn't know what was in here. We were getting a highly intelligent, very competitive uh, player. I never thought there'd be a second season. I just knew that if I was called on, I better be ready to go in, and I just kind of zeroed in on that. And it made it real simple. I didn't, I didn't have any outside things that could distract me. I just had one thing, and that was to, to try to play well. This was my one shot. You know, he didn't look like anything special. Uh, just real quiet, really nice guy, just kind of feeling his way around. I went into camp, and I remembered uh, knowing who everybody was, and, and uh, Strangely enough, I remember calling, calling an old coach at home and saying, hey, they're not that good. That made it fun. I knew that I could at least compete with them. And uh, again, I had no delusions about being a player or getting a chance to play much, but I looked forward to the practices. I looked forward to the drills and uh, getting to see how you could hold up against some of these guys. Ricky Green was one of the first people that came and told me. He says, uh, coach, he says, uh, this is a good one. And he said, he's something special. He was somebody who liked to play the game and, and was very tough in training camp and, and got right up in guys' faces and uh, gave Ricky Green all he could handle and practice every day. Played against him in an exhibition game uh, when I was with the Boston Celtics. And uh, I knew right then that Stockton was going to be good. Um, I had no idea he was going to be as good as he was. And I don't think anybody could have. There was never any question about his ability to play. The biggest question mark that we had was would he hold up? <laughs> and a little did we know that he'd hold up as well as he has and played as long as he has. John's parents were thrilled their son had fulfilled a lifelong dream by just making it to the NBA. I can remember when John was a rookie in sec first and second year, my wife used to get in our old Oldsmobile station wagon. If we drove over here about six blocks and pointed the, the car towards Salt Lake City, we could get a hot rod and uh, he'd fade in and fade out and we'd sit out there in that car just tickled to death to be able to listen to it because the jazz were never broadcast up here. John's rookie season was a modest one. He averaged 18 minutes, five points, and five assists per contest. There's a lot of things that change between NBA and college. Bodies are bigger, they're much faster, much more athletic. They can cover ground uh, with, with just wingspan. Uh, so you had to do things a little bit sooner. You had to pass sooner. You had to make decisions sooner. You have to do things quicker. You know, at the end of his first year, I said, 
the difference in you making it in this league, just being another guy and maybe in a couple of years being cut, you have to uh, uh, increase your range. Because uh, the way we play and the way we want to get the ball inside, we are, you've got to be a more than adequate three-point shooter. Well, he went home and he took care of that. Stockton's second season, Utah added rookie Carl Malone. The pair bonded instantly in a game against Houston. Ralph Sampson was playing on the low side of him. He was on the block, and he was really, really overplaying it. And for some reason, I threw the ball behind Ralph Sampson. So he's leaning out this way, and I threw the ball from behind him. Don't know to this day. I don't know why. Why I threw it wasn't there was nothing there. It wasn't open, but that instant that I loaded to throw, Carl spun and threw his hand behind Ralph Sampson, and laid it up. And I, I marveled at, at at his end of that. I don't know why I threw it. I, it wouldn't be construed as a good pass, other than it was completed for a layup. It was just an incredible move, and he read something there. That, that forever gave me confidence throwing him just about any pass. Carl sets the screen, stock left to right, rolls to Carl. He's under, slam it in with a left hand. Oh, what a play. After playing behind Ricky Green for most of his first three seasons, Stockton became the team's floor general in his fourth year. It was a watershed season for the Jazz and John. The newly appointed point guard broke the NBA's all-time single season assist record with 1,128, surpassing the previous mark set by Isaiah Thomas. Three, two, a leap and leader by Stock, no good. Rebound, Stockton. Left side of Bailey, all alone. He scores. What a play by John Stockton. We were pretty good up to a certain point, but when those two came into their own, this franchise just was put on their shoulders. Perry's back. Great move by Stockton. <laughs> Stockton behind his back and he dished him alone. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen. Led by Stockton and Malone, Utah won what was then a franchise best 47 games during the 1987-88 season. In the playoffs, they pushed the defending champion Los Angeles Lakers to a seven-game series in the Western Conference semifinals. John Stockton was the reason that we played seven games. He kept his team poised, they were confident, they felt that they had a chance to really beat us, and we only won right at the end. Uh, in that uh, seventh game. That was the year that they really arrived as a team and, and those two players became uh, the absolute anchors of, uh, of one of the greatest runs of a team in the history of the NBA. That run included five Midwest Division titles and in the 1996-97 season, Utah won a franchise record 64 games, reaching heights never seen before in game six of the Western Conference Finals against the Houston Rockets. And we had a great comeback. Stockton, three on two, keeps it, tie game. That whole last four minutes or five minutes of that fourth quarter were so improbable. And Stockton has been the man here in the fourth quarter. Everything came together. What's at stake? The Utah Jazz, if they can pull out a victory here, go to the NBA Finals for the first time. We had a full house in here, as a matter of fact, and uh, Jack was watching it down at the house. And this place was packed, and I went home so I could watch it because everybody's talking. So I went home and I was sitting in the living room when he shot it all by myself. All I saw of that game was probably the last minute. And it's the same play we, we ran all the time. So guys want to shot. Uh, in those situations, uh, usually you can step up and make them. You know, I'm sure that's what every kid in the world dreams about doing that one time. You know? so it was no different for John, I'm sure. Russell will inbound at half court. I was in the, the corner in front of the bench there, and when I saw him with the ball and no one near him, I'm like, oh my God. Uh -oh. Stockton, open three. Good! John Stockton sends the Utah Jazz to the end. Well, I was sitting on the bench, so I got a good view of it. When it left his hands, I just got up and started walking to the locker room. I just knew. I mean, I knew the guy was going to make it because he's just ice. I knew it was in. Uh, that's the kind of player that he is. He was not going to be denied that moment. When he hit that shot, we all screamed so loud that we woke up everybody. <laughs> I just went bonkers, and I came down the alley here, which is two blocks, and people were standing up so they knew I'd be coming. And uh, they were, God, it was, it was great. It was really that was a big thrill for me. We have never seen this kind of emotion from Stockton <laughs> and Malone, and finally, their day has come. He was acting like a little kid. He jumped up and down. He was had his 
first question, he was just jumping up and down. He was the happiest guy in the world. It was so much fun just seeing him hit that. And when he started, you know, jumping up and down, we thought, hey, we can do it too. He made that shot. I was running around the house crazy. <laughs> I running all over the house. <laughs> doing what he did and everything. It was a special day. Uh, you don't see him showing any emotion on the court, and that one was something else. That was so many things all wrapped up into one. It was, it was our first chance to go to the championship. It was really the first time we'd been able to beat Houston at anything. I've never really gotten over My first year I got traded to Houston, and he had to shout over me to, to send the Jazz to the finals. It was just a terrific shot. And what a great moment for the Utah franchise. Their proudest moment ever. It's got to be the greatest uh, shot in jazz history in terms of what it meant to the team. After knocking off Houston to reach the NBA Finals for the first time in franchise history, Utah met the defending champion Chicago Bulls. The Bulls led the series two games to one and had a five point lead with just over two minutes remaining in game four when Stockton took over once again. John then stole the ball from Michael Jordan and was fouled on the fast break, pulling the Jazz even closer from the free throw line. That set up another magical moment in the game's final minute. Game four of the NBA Finals with the Bulls up two games to one. And Jordan comes up court. Stockton fires down. John Stockton, you work on this pass your whole life. Stockton, normally so stolen, he says, yeah. <laughs> Two, three, <laughs> give him a pogo stick out there. <laughs> to me, that's a pass there that I'll remember. Out of all the great ones he's made, I'll remember this one right here probably from, for the rest of my career because it had to be, like I said, the perfect pass. With the win, the Jazz evened the series at two games apiece, but the Bulls took the next two and the title. The following year, Utah and Chicago each won 62 games during the regular season and met one more time for the ultimate prize. Jordan and the Bulls came away with the trophy a second time, taking the series four games to two. It's not a uh, pleasurable experience, I can assure you that. It's a lot of work to go to put in and end up like this. The balance that we had against this team the two years in the finals was probably, you know, the, one of the greatest, some of the greatest finals that I've played in because of the fact that, you know, they were just such a tenacity team that, you know, they just kept coming back. And it was two years in a row that, you know, we, we had to beat this team. John Stockton and Carl Malone have shared their biggest moments in basketball together. Two trips to the NBA Finals, members of two gold medal Olympic dream teams, they shared the most viable player award at the 1993 All-Star Game in Salt Lake City, and at the Mid-Season Classic in 1997, the pair were picked as two of the top 50 players of all time. Throughout their 18 years as teammates, which stands as the longest running tandem in NBA history, the dynamic duo became synonymous with proficiency, professionalism, and of course, the pick and roll. You gotta be able to say it like it's one word. You know? Hammer duck, stock to the balloon, at their ever loving best. You can't really talk about one in basketball without the other one. What a wonderful combination. John getting the pick and rolls from the best power forward in the history of basketball. Do they do it well? They do it the best of anybody I have ever seen. Nobody probably in the history of basketball has run the pick and roll like John and Carl Malone. It's amazing to watch, especially after all these years when people have seen him do it and still can't stop it. Scoop it up at him. Pick and roll, Carl Malone. But what a deadly weapon. I mean, it's, it's like the sky hook. It's, you know, it's one of a kind. Stop tandem. Two guys that are capable of winning games by themselves. That's at any age. They, the greatest screen role players I've ever seen in, in in the game. In terms of a twosome, they, they've probably and their skills have complemented themselves 
about as well as any two people, given the positions they've played, and, and, I, and I suppose they've exploited each other well. Carl bring the, the brute strength to force, and John, uh, the savvy, the passing, the shooting. Those two were lucky to have the opportunity to play with each other for so long. They're both very blessed that they got a chance to play with each other. They're two guys who, uh, you know, I talk about how they make other players better. They made each other better. I always like resented Carl Malone for getting to play with a point guard that good. Cause that's all you really want. If you're gonna run the floor, like Carl who's terrific, run the floor every play, you know you're gonna get the ball. One of the great things about Carl Malone is that he might be the best running forward that has ever played the game. And one of the reasons he's such a great running forward is he plays with a point guard who will always give the ball up. People talk about he and Malone being in the league so many years, but that's okay because they're farther ahead in knowledge of the game and how to play the game than many players ever will be. When I raise my children, I will raise them and tell them that's who you want to be like. That's how you want to emulate your life. And, and I think uh, it's a testimony to those two men that, uh, that a lot of people feel that way. The Stockton Malone contribution to the Utah Jazz, I mean, it's just second to nothing in uh, major sports. It's just a great story of uh, these guys have played together for so many years and stayed healthy, and no matter who their teammates are, over the period of 20-odd uh, seasons, these guys have kept this franchise at the top. When you talk about greatness, you have to enter longevity in there, be able to keep your body uh, healthy and uh, to play for many, many years. And nobody's played longer at that position than John Stockton. You use the, the, the phrase freak of nature, I think would fit him well. Uh, nobody is supposed to be 40 plus years of age and still being able to do the things that he does. You can take the 24 year old and play against those guys and quickness means nothing. It's when you take that burst of speed. How you come off a pick like John and uh, runs it with Carl. He just knows how to, to basically sucker those other players into doing what he wants them to do. And that's, uh, that's just being a smart player. It's good to watch him, you know, teach the young guys a few tricks because all the young guys can come in and run and jump and do all the fancy stuff. And, you know, at the end of the night, you know, he's five for seven with 12 assists and they can't figure out what happened. <laughs> he's just the ultimate point guard. I mean, it you know, you learn so much from you know when you're when you're playing against him. You know, he's very heady, smart. He's a basketball genius. In order to do it as long as he's done it, and as good as he's done it, you have to be smarter than the next guy. So he's taken care of himself well over the years, and and not only physically but maintained his his mental stamina as well. There were days when I just couldn't seem to get my focus going, or wasn't feeling too good, or my back hurt, or whatever just go over and sit by John for a little bit and all of a sudden you could get you know you could get yourself dialed back in pretty quickly. I feel like it's my job to be ready to play every night and and even more than that I feel like I owe it to my teammates to be ready to play every night. I, I don't want to let them down. I don't want I don't want anybody disappointed in me. I don't want anybody disappointed in our team and that goes from coaches, teammates, family members, kids, parents, whatever. John rarely let anyone down. He was an Iron Man, missing just 22 games throughout his career. Stock played in every single game, 17 of his 19 years. John has a, has a great body. People don't realize uh, you know, what a good build he has. He's a powerful man. I never fully get out of shape, and, and I think a lot of guys get injured trying to get back into shape. They, they overdo it, overdo it, and then there's never a layoff again with the long season to get through it. He's amazing. He, uh, people have no idea of, of the, the things he does to stay in shape. Whether it be when he's at the lake taking an hour and riding to the top of the mountain, you know, which nobody does. Everybody gets in a th you know, four-wheeler or something and goes to the top of the mountain to the, to the lookout post at the ranger station. Well, John doesn't. He gets on his bike and he pedals his butt up there and, and takes a look around and says how beautiful it is and comes back and tells us about it. But, uh, that's the kind of thing that he'll do that nobody really has any idea about. You know, he'll be gone for an hour and a half. What's he doing? Oh, I went for a bike ride. You know, he's not going for a bike ride. He's doing something that he knows that's going to help him in the next season or the next week or the next month or maybe the next year. Who knows? For him to stay healthy and to stay fit and to be as uh, great a player as he's been for so long and to miss so few games and to play in the playoffs so many years, it's, 
Uh, he's, it's amazing. I mean, he's got to be one of the toughest competitors in all of sports, you know, in the history of all sports. 6'1", 170 pounds. If you asked him to go set a pick on Shaq, he had no problem with it. Whatever, whatever it took, you know, that seemed like to be his motto, whatever it took to win the game, I'll do it. I try to run him over when he tries it with me. Um, you know, he, he gets up onto you and uh, he get, gives you a good shot. Very few guards will go do that. Very few guards will go and sacrifice their body to get their teammate open. You know, they think, well, if I just bring the ball up and get it to the right person, I've done my job. John plays the complete game. He is so focused on playing, you know, his mind wills his body to heal or that he just ignores that he's got any pain going on. Yeah, I don't even know if he feels pain. John Stockton is tough. Well, I don't know if you can write the word uh, down and, and, and describe anybody else other than John Stockton when it comes to playing the game of basketball. When he went to the Olympics, you know, he, he had a broken fibula and uh, a lot of plays, it would have been a way to cop out. I made the Olympic team, but I broke my leg or something. Uh, but he continued to compete. There are a lot of great players in this league, uh, but somehow they, they seem to get injured or miss games. And uh, John Stockton, you pretty much can pencil in 82 games every year, and you know what you're going to get. And it doesn't matter uh, if he's banged up, if he's sore, if he's hurt. You know he's going to be there, you know he's going to play the minutes, and you know he's going to produce. If he didn't have his work ethic and, and his ability to stay focused, uh, uh, he wouldn't be where he is right now. In a lot of ways, it's as important what you do before you go on the court than it is. Uh, what you do on the court because there's a carryover and, and uh, I've tried to make myself uh, as prepared as I can uh, physically, mentally, uh, for, for every contest, every season. The mental part of it has been something that John has uh, absolutely surpassed everybody else in. He gets in the heads of the opponent. I think that through the years, you know, a lot of guys wonder, who is this guy that wears his pants a little bit shorter? That's a competitor. You, He's got that fire in his eye. Tough guy to compete against, a guy who uh, never backed down. It's a headache, you know, because you know it's not a night off. Uh, you know, he's going to bring it uh, when he's out there on the floor. And so, uh, you know, he plays hard. He loves the uh, competition. He loves to go against the, the best. Stockton's killer instinct was never more evident than at crunch time. He's got running room. Stockton, God, hang it up. It's good. Seconds left. Eight. Stockton right side. Three pointer. It's good. He did it. He did it. The Jazz win the game. Stockton on the turn for the win. Oh. An incredible play by an incredible player. But on the screen. Stockton goes right side. He's open. He'll take it for 20. Got it. Stockton hits it. John's competitive spirit goes far beyond the basketball court. Will he cheat to win? I don't think he'd cheat to win. Um, but I think he's going to take advantage of the rules. I've played Pictionary with him where it's the world championship. I mean, it doesn't matter. If he's going to do it, he's going to try and beat you. Almost eating dinner, you look over and who's eating faster, you know? And it's like, better get going because you're not going to get another bite. The players were playing Papa Shot with each other and it was winner stays on. Well, after we've been playing for a while, this 12-year-old kid in a wheelchair comes up to John and, and wants to, or comes to the, you know, can I play? You got, yeah, you can. Well, it turns out the kid's pretty good. And it's apparent that he's going to beat John. John gets up and starts blocking his shot. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture. And then I realized there wasn't really anything wrong with it. It was just a very clear definition of how competitive John Stockton is. He's very competitive. I, I have the stitches right across here to, to prove that. Um, we are playing hockey and we're all out there. It's the kids and parents and we're both going for the puck and boom. He went out on that. I ended up on the ice with needing a couple stitches, six stitches to be exact. He's very competitive, but it is in a very um, friendly manner. I mean, it's... Did he help you back up? Yeah, he did. <laughs> He did. He brought me to go get my stitches. John's an average guy. John likes to play softball. He likes to ride four-wheelers. He likes to um, hang out, likes to swim, water ski. He's an um, avid reader. 
Oh, he loves to read about science stuff. He's into natural medicine. He's one of those guys that irritates you from the standpoint of the day after the season's over, he can go out and shoot 80 on the golf course, you know. You put a bat in his hands, he can start knocking balls over the, the fence. I taught English one time. He's kind of a Dickens character, I think, a little bit. And he's kind of steely and, and he's clever. And I think he's verbally very clever, okay? Uh, he's got a great sense of humor and he's highly intelligent. We're on a bus, we're ready to leave after the game and go to the airport. And Carl Malone's usually the last guy to get on the, on the bus because he's doing all these interviews and whatever. And uh, John will yell at Sloan, and Coach Sloan, he'll say, Hey, Jerry, we don't need the mailman, let's leave him. We can win without him. Besides that, he's got enough money, let him buy his own airplane. We'll see him there tomorrow. And about this time, Carl walks on the bus, and John says, Hey, Carl, all the guys want to leave you. I said, I'm not going anywhere without the mailman. <laughs> He could do my voice pretty good and my inflection. In India, they worship this body. And every once in a while, on the bus, we would hear it from the back of the bus coming, coming out, you know, some, some cliche that I had, you know. And that guy wasn't ready. When we called on him, we pushed his button, but he wasn't ready. And John could imitate that. Deadly, you're making a million a year. Griffith, you're making 500,000. 300,000, 600,000. What's Larry Bird worth? 18 million, 20 million? He's kicking our butts. <laughs> he was trying to motivate us. We were down by 20, so we went out and lost by 30. Shy is not even a word that would you, you would use to describe him. And our kids, he's just, he's not Uncle John, the NBA player. He's Uncle John, they call Uncle Fun. Always, you know, willing to have fun, always willing to help out. He's always there for you. He helps me out a lot with basketball. Uh, he really helps me out a lot in homework. He takes us to the lake every summer in Spokane, and then we drive out to the lake, and he reads to us every night. John's love for basketball is exceeded only by the love for his family. My kids, it's, it's all about them. John is so focused and uh, you know, stays on his course. And uh, you know, his family became a priority, and, and even over a, a priority over the NBA. If he had to bounce around and pick up his family, that would be almost, I won't say entirely unacceptable, almost unacceptable to him, because he is deeply rooted in the family. A day that's not a game day, he's up at seven o'clock taking Houston off to school. Then he comes back, he takes all the, the rest of the kids to school that starts at 8.20, comes back home, he gets Samuel's at his breakfast every once in a while, and off he, off he goes to practice. And I think that right there tells you what kind of guy he is, what kind of family man he is. It's a family that John shielded from the NBA spotlight. I know we've done the right thing. I look at our kids and you can see that we've raised them um, in the most normal environment that we can. He's real concerned about growing up in a famous world. He just doesn't want his kids to do that. And so he goes into his little cocoon and he really protects himself. Incredibly proud of him, how he's handled himself as a basketball player, how he's handled himself as a parent, as a father to those darling kids. Honestly, just simply wanted to play basketball and go home and, and be with his family. And, and it's a job like any other job from that standpoint. The travel and being away from his family and that thing has been, uh, that's the hardest thing on him. As far as the playing and stuff like that, he could do that for a long time. Uh, so I thought, I thought that he wouldn't have lasted as long as he has because of uh, just the, the time frame away from his family. John's NBA journey may now be over, but he won't be far from the game. Probably be coaching football, basketball, and baseball, soccer, girls soccer, <laughs> whatever. I don't know. I, uh, I've enjoyed that with my kids. Um, and I think I'd enjoy it if, even if it wasn't my kids. It's just a great opportunity to take what I've learned and, uh, and really, I think, do it, do it the right way. The Spokane community has already reaped the benefits from Stockton's generosity. In November of 2002, he opened the warehouse, a 40,000 square foot sports complex that sits just across the street from Gonzaga. The facility features five basketball courts, which includes an old Delta Center floor and a state-of-the-art baseball practice area. We get just people that come by on a daily basis saying, wow, what a nice thing that John did and 
I think people are genuinely excited. I know the little kids that play in here are, the adults that come in, and uh, I, I'd say, I think, safely say that the community is excited about it. He's one of a kind. A guy that just got it done, never flashy. Choir boy with Mike Tyson's punch. Playing against John Stockton it would be like painting against Picasso. He's the best at it. I think he's a dying breed, especially at the point guard position. I think John, over the years, has had the kind of respect that he's kind of set a standard for what the point guard position is all about. I don't think anyone, um, you know, will, will come along with that type of stamina and can do it. Um, you know, with that type of perfection for, for this long. A guy who probably controlled a team and a game better than anybody I've ever seen. Very pesty, but, you know, uh, probably one of the greatest players to ever play the game in his position. That's on both ends of the court. So they talk about records that will never be broken. I think John's assist record will never be broken. I don't, I don't think there's a, a chance that will even happen. I have so much respect for this guy his uh, approach to the game, the, the way he did it, his court carriage. One of the greatest point guards to ever play the game, uh, toughness, uh, hard working. And every time that, that I would play against him, I used to tell my boys, watch the game tonight. I don't care if other games you watch, but you watch John Stockton play. Doesn't care who gets the credit and is just there for the team. That's his sole function out there is to help the team win games. Uh, and that. That caliber of unselfishness is, is a, and skills in the same package is, is I think, uh, an incredibly powerful thing that um, it'll be a while before the NBA sees that again. Just goes to show you when you have God-given ability, you put it to the maximum of use, uh, you make the best of every situation, you work hard every day, you do what's right, uh, the great things can happen. I think he's a very positive role model for our youth and for other players that are looking to come into the NBA. He's just one of those role models, man. I mean, millions of kids could look at John and say, man, this is, this is a guy I want to be just like. In this day and age where we're looking for people to emulate, John is the kind of guy you want to put on a pedestal and say, this is the guy you want to be like. The most amazing thing is how he's been able to balance his family uh, in the NBA limelight. Well, I'll tell you what means more to me in all the basketball in the world is the kind of person he is. People don't believe me, but that's the God's truth. I'm more proud of the kind of person he is and the kind of family he has. And I mean, take the basketball, that's about fifth. It looks like every guy that you went to school with, you think that was a pretty good guy. And I think that oftentimes the one thing that never comes up is how much ability he has. His success on the basketball court, uh, it, you know, made him notable around the world, basically. But, you know, to us here, he's just a, a very nice man. It's great to see a friend of yours succeed to the level he has and know that he's done it right. The best that ever uh, played the game at, that, at his position, that's the first thing I think of. Perfection. You know, he is the Michelangelo of point guards. He makes plays look so easy, but on the other hand, when you have asked some other people to try to do that, that's impossible. There's no question in my mind, if you say one of the top point guards ever play this game, John Stockton's name is going to be there because uh, uh, he is. And he's proven it. If any guy out there in high school, junior high, wants to play the point guard position, they should try to be like John Stockton. Great player. I mean, a uh, great guy, too. Uh, he's going to be in the Hall of Fame, as everybody know, and, um, you know, uh, I admire him a lot. If you had told me that someday he was going to be a Hall of Famer, or a, uh, an Olympic champion, uh, uh, b being saying the best point guard that ever lived, then I would have said you're a liar because nobody knew that. All the cliches, all the trite things you say, uh, they're true about John Stock. He's a better person than he is a player. He plays basketball the way it's supposed to be played, and he's one of those guys who makes his teammates better, and there's not a lot of people you can say that about. I've got to know John, uh, number one, as a man, as a father, as a husband. I consider him a friend, but I got great memories uh, of the best point guard to ever play the game. I just hope that the NBA have appreciated what a guy is trying to do for all these years, uh, undersized, they say, and all of that. 
from a little town and he wasn't fast enough. He never crossed anybody over between the legs behind the back. He just played the game like he, he's supposed to play it. I'm not sure we'll ever see a guy that has all those attributes, but we hope for the sake of basketball there is because I think that's what basketball needs, more John Stockton's. Say hello and wave goodbye. I always hoped that I'd get one shot at it, that I'd get to try out for a team at some point in time, and I thought that, that my career would be complete at that point. If a person were going to try to quantify accurately what John Stockton's meant to the Jazz over his career, it would be an exercise in futility. I think there is no way to measure what John's meant to the Jazz. The day John announced his retirement, he was asked when would be the next time he picked up a basketball and played again. Stockton's response, tomorrow, probably out in the yard. It's still a great game. Indeed, it is, and John Stockton is one of the best to ever play it. What an amazing ride it has been for John Stockton. And tomorrow night it continues with the retirement of John's number 12 into the rafters of the Delta Center. That ceremony, of course, will take place at halftime of the Jazz Hornets game. Make sure you tune in right here to KJazz TV tomorrow night, beginning at 6.30 for Jazz Tonight, where we'll begin our coverage of Stockton's special night. For everyone involved, thanks for joining us, and have a great night. In the city that has seen the Olympic flame. Tonight you see magic in college football. A night that the sport has never seen and will never forget. Over the past few days, fans were witness to all that is good in Utah sports. And tonight that continues as we gather at the Delta Center to celebrate the basketball career of a favorite son. It's Jersey retirement night for number 12, John Stockton. Present and former players on hand. A chance for fans to reflect and go retro. John's parents, Jack and Clementine, are in town. So are former jazz men, Adrian Dantley. And former teammate, Jeff Hornacek. And when the night is over, another jersey will hang from the rafters of the Delta Center. As you can tell, it is a raucous crowd. Welcome to Jazz Tonight. Presented by New Ways, as we bring you our pregame show tonight with the usual cast of characters and the center of attention tonight, who is a most reluctant center of attention, but we're glad to have you here. John Stockton, uh, well, first of all, congratulations, John, because the honor to have your jersey retired has got to be one that um, has got to be the greatest feeling as a, as a player, and maybe it won't sink in and feel comfortable until it's all over with. Well, it is a wonderful honor, but uh, as I mentioned last night, I'm going to mention again today, it's... It's something I feel I share with my teammates and the people have had something to do with this all along because you don't play this game alone. It's a team sport, and when 12 goes up, it's everybody's number. Well, and of course, you can't do John Stockton without the mailman, who now joins us as well. Oh, man. What's so, up? Nothing. <laughs> How you guys? Mail, welcome. <laughs> Glad to be welcome. <laughs> John, let me, let me ask you, first of all, because we've joked about it, but it's true. I know that this isn't the most comfortable position for you. We just had a press conference. You talked about um, really wanting to get this over with, but it is a night that I think you probably never aspired to, am I right, as a player, because you don't have time to think about that as you go through a career? Well, it certainly isn't anything you think about. At least I, I don't think you should. It's... Uh... Uh, as you mentioned, it's a great honor. I don't want to detract from that. A lot of people put a lot of effort into it, but uh, you're not out there playing the game hoping your jersey gets retired. You're out there trying to win a, a ball game, and it uh, makes it pretty simple that way. 
You know, John, one of the things that kind of struck me last night at the event, uh, having the current jazz team there, was just the, the kind of different paradigm that, that we all lived in as players compared to the guys that are playing now. And Mailman's had some recent experience with some of those guys out in L.A. Uh, but uh, when you look at the, at the NBA now and, and you look at, at how we, the culture that we kind of grew up in playing ball, what, what strikes you as the differences now? Expectations more than anything. I, I think guys come into this game now expecting – expecting to be starters, expecting to be all-stars, expecting things to be giving to, given to them, handed out. And, and uh, I think back when I came in, I expected to be cut. That was the level of my <laughs> expectation. So, uh, and maybe that's an individual thing. But I also looked at that team, and I've watched them play a little bit. They're enthusiastic about the game. Uh, they're really excited about coming out and playing. And, and you can see them playing Jerry's style. And to me, that's exciting. It's a little bit of a rebirth. And, and maybe they can say what we don't find so appealing about the league. I wanted to ask you, of course, Mark and I have gone through it, and as much as you love the game, and as, as much as, as long as you've played, there's always a transition when you're done playing to go to the life, that, the normal life with your family. How was that transition for you? It's been very busy, um, and I think you guys have gone through it. There, there's no restrictions on your time. You don't have to be at practice. You don't have to be at the game, so you're just fair game. Was it so. weird waking up that next morning, though, and saying, don't have to go to practice, or what, what am I going to do? No, it was, it was wow, I, yeah. I don't have to go to practice. <laughs> no, it was, uh, I, I did enjoy practice, so that's a little bit of a joke, but uh, uh, there's parts of it I sure miss. I miss you guys. I miss going to the locker room and, and having practices, but I also don't miss not missing my kids' games right. when they play, and uh, that used to be almost heartbreaking as they were getting older, knowing that it won't be long, and they won't, I won't have those opportunities, and I'm off playing, so... I'm thankful that it turned out the way it did. Bale, this is your chance. You probably asked him a lot of questions, but now is your chance in front of the cameras to ask him something. <laughs> I really don't. The only, only thing I have to say is I think I said it last night uh, when I talked to him, what he meant to me as a player. Uh, I don't think I would have had the success that I had without him. And I've been on the other side, like Mark said earlier. I've seen uh, the selfish initiatives that will. And... He remind me of what my coach always told me in high school, uh, make your teammate better. And that's what he tried to do every single night. How many times did you see Stock going down the floor wide open for a layup, his big man busting his behind to get down the floor, he stop at the free throw line and give you a layup. That's what basketball is about. And I, I think I've told him all along, uh, if I ever missed him, it was definitely this year. So, <laughs> and like I said, everything that he deserved, Everything that he got, and he deserved it, and he worked his butt off to get it. John, in the press conference a few minutes ago, you said something that I thought was really interesting. You talked about doubt and that what fueled your career was the doubt. After the first year, you worried about the second. Uh, let me ask you, did, you, did that help your career? Did you play scared at times because of that doubt that you had to prove yourself year to year, game to game? No, I think the doubt was... Uh, at night before the game, shoot around in the morning, all afternoon till the game. Once the ball went up, I think uh, doubt goes away, and maybe that's where uh, you know your competitiveness comes in, or I don't know, or your trust in your teammates, and uh, that's when I felt it all came together. I wasn't, I, I never felt like I played a game scared, um, you know, and not to keep passing it back, but largely because of my teammates. These guys right here were terrific. Um, when I was a very young player, these guys absolutely took care of me, and as we got older, I just. I, took care of us. Yeah. <laughs> no, then, as we got older, obviously Carl, I, I played my whole career nearly with Carl Malone, and uh, uh, he says I made his job easy, and I just have to laugh because anybody that played here and left know, knows who made it, whose job easier. <laughs> <laughs> no, everything went through him, and uh, I'm just thankful for the type of guy he was because uh, nobody wanted to listen to me, but they listened to him, and, and it, when he put his foot down, it was down. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. Guys, if you'll stick around for one more segment, John, I promise you'll be out of here after the next segment, okay? We'll be back with more jazz tonight in just a moment. We have a simple little thing we do once in a while, which he really loved as he got a little older, is to run 17s. And I think he only lost that one time in the 18 years that I was involved here with him. And that tells you about when he was tired, when he didn't feel well. He went out and won there, where it's more difficult to do than it is when he has his teammate or the fans and everyone else supporting him. 
So for all those things, the little things, it meant a great deal to us. It was really important. Thank you, John. And my guess is that one time probably bugged the heck out of you, didn't it? Yeah, because I think the person that did it was talking trash afterwards. So. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. we got the mailman, Mark Eaton, Thurl Bailey, and, of course, the man whose number goes up in the rafters tonight, John Stockton. You know, we wanted to ask uh, Mayo as long as he's here. We talked a little bit about uh, you know playing with John, and especially as big guys sitting sort of at this end of the of the uh, station here. Uh, how important it was to have a guard out on the floor that could get you the ball when you needed him. Now, T and I, we only saw the Rock once in a while, but the mailman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, no. Well, there, <laughs> the thing about it is now they won't let you touch anybody. And back when we played the game, they let you just fight, just scratch it, get across. And I only had a uh, split second when I was free to get the ball. And every single time, it was right there where I could do something with it. It's one thing to get the ball, but you've got to do something with it once you get it. So that's one of the things I remember about John. With no communication at all, he had the ball that I could do something with it all the time. And you've seen basketball now. Look around the league right now. That's a dying breed. It will never be another one. You can you can flip them up and roll them around, doing anything any way you want to do. It'll never it'll never be another John Stock. You know we did run that play 55 once a year. <laughs> uh, John, you made some um, very pointed statements last night about teams now versus uh, you know in the past. But um, a lot of kids out there watching you right now. You had to make one statement about kids who are competing in sports and team sports right now. What would that be? Well, to use a, um, a modern statement, well, it's not about you. It's about the group. And we, uh, we were kind of commiserating how, how things are never the same. It wasn't like we used to play. There are a lot of things that are, but just the evolution of the league, there's charters now, and you have all this space, and you have individual rooms. And um, I miss getting to know my teammates. I miss, the, you know, we all, know, we all knew each other knew our families, knew our friends, knew how we grew up. And uh, that gets rid of a lot of problems when you can handle that off the court. And you get on the court and you're willing to do anything for your, for your teammate. I would like to add a little bit to that, what Stockton's saying. Go right ahead. Well, please allow me. I, I came up here. Uh, think about it now. They get on the plane. They have their earphones on. Then they get their phone. In the locker room, you don't even have any idea what to, what's going on, so you don't know your player. And that's the most important thing now is, like Stock said, I faced it. I was with a group of guys that it wasn't what was on the front of the jersey. It was what's on the back of the jersey. I rode with a teammate for a whole year, a whole year, and he had his earphones in the whole year. John, you, you, you know, we joke about, about how much you really didn't like the spotlight um, off the floor. Did that make it easier for you? Because some guys retire and have a hard time leaving the limelight. That is part of the job, as we all know. Uh, some, some relish it, some don't. Did the fact that that was never really appealing to you, did that make the transition that Thurl talked about a little bit easier? Uh, or do you miss it? Uh, maybe it did. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't miss it. Um, I miss the fellas. I miss those, those rides on the bus where, where you're chirping back and forth at each other. <laughs> Um, you just don't get that in everyday walk of life. You're uh, uh, where every, there's no holes barred. You can, uh, I mean, <laughs> we've, we've covered race, we've covered religion, <laughs> we've covered everything on the bus. And, uh, uh, and really, there's, there's nothing that you hold back. So I, that I missed. But no, the, uh, uh, the limelight, uh, that's something that was something you had to go through in order to play. And plus, Carl took it all anyway. Uh, some, some, of it he, some of it he did because he liked it. But, but some of it he did because he knew I didn't, and I appreciate that. All right, now, I, I remember one story when we had lost a few games in a row. We were back east, and we were in Charlotte, okay? And someone, uh, namely some, a point guard named John Stockton, uh, had heard, overheard something supposedly on the radio that uh, Grandmama Larry Johnson had said about Mailman. Do you remember this? Yeah, he, 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 he got my goat that night. Got he, he, got, he, needed, he needed something to Man, get us going. Mailman went, I think, for 56 that night. 
Yeah, and I got every pass, I think, from, from Stock. Right. <laughs> you wouldn't, and, you and fabricated the, a quote? Is that, is yes, that the story he lied. you made up a he quote? Lied. He lied. So forget the fabricating. He lied. Okay. I had, Steve, I had, I had some reliable sources <laughs> <laughs> that told me. Always get away with reliable sources. That, that told me that somebody had said something. I merely relayed what I had heard He's from He's training for a career source. in journalism. This guy's got all the makings of no, a no, no. guy. You hear reliable source. My source told me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to, uh, I don't know how much time we have, but, you know, this, this is an awesome opportunity for me, and I know for Mark, to be in this situation, be on the floor again with you guys. You know, as I'm looking over here at AD and, and Frank Layden, uh, I want to personally thank both of you for being my teammates. I remember when you both came in and, you know, I helped you work on your free throws and you were a little scared, <laughs> put, put you under my wing. And, but uh, <laughs> I just want to, you know, just publicly say that, you know, you guys are, uh, you know, everybody loves you, but we had a chance to live with you, be with you, be friends with you, and those things never die. So appreciate it. Thanks, guys. I want to say thanks, thanks to you guys, uh, really. I want to say thanks to you guys up here right now that made my career a lot easier. I learned, I learned a lot from you guys. I learned how to uh, take care of myself. I learned a lot from AD, and every opportunity I get, I talk about AD. But this is when basketball was basketball, and I appreciate you guys. I really do. And, John, you, I think you said it best. You, you've bought the mortuary in Spokane, and as you said earlier in the press conference, not many guys get to hear their eulogy before they're gone, but uh, apparently you have for the last couple of days, and it's going to continue tonight. Well, and, I, and I'm still alive and breathing to, to <laughs> brag about it. So. It's been very nice. Sometimes the seat's been a little hot, but uh, we're, we're nearing the end. And uh, again, I'm going to mention AD. I'm, I'm so excited to see him over there. It's been a long time since he's been around the Utah Jazz, a place where he belongs. And uh, he's meant so much to all of us that have been up here. And that means ultimately to this organization. So it's neat to see him over there. Guys, thanks. We're going to take a break. We'll be back with more. I know we got to uh, release John because he's got other obligations. It's not over for him yet. We'll be back with Adrian Dantley and Frank Layden in just a moment. Time now for the State Farm Halftime Report, brought to you by your participating Utah State Farm Insurance agent. The Jazz trail by 15, but now we take you courtside for the retirement of jersey number 12. Once again, Jazz fans, you get to witness history courtesy of this wonderful individual. Heads up to the super screen for a John Stockton video. The Utah Jazz select John Stockton of Gonzaga University. The journey began in 1984 when the Utah Jazz selected a little known point guard from Gonzaga University. I'd like to say that I'm very excited at the possibility of playing with the Utah Jazz. Few, if any, gave this bright-eyed young rookie a chance to last more than a year. But what they failed to measure was John Stockton's courage, determination, and his fierce will to win. Streak off of here and go down the side. They do. Stock's got it. He's got running room. Stockton, dive, hang it up. It's good. It's good. The Jazz win it. The Jazz win it. I can't believe it. The Jazz win it. Night in and night out, John gave his best. Win or lose, his resolve never wavered. And it wasn't long before NBA fans would stand up and take notice. Seven seconds, six, five, Stockton drives, put it up, it's good, Stockton, John Stockton, unbelievable. There were times when he made the impossible look easy. Look John at that, that's been a John Stockton. He just put his signature on this game. NBA records would soon follow. Shot up, it's there, he did it, he did it! A new NBA assist king! And though he is small in stature, Stockton's accomplishments place him amongst the giants of the game. I've said it many a time, I'll say it again. He's the greatest point guard that ever played the game. John Stockton was a hero on the basketball court and a regular guy off of it. And maybe that's what made him so special. John was just one of us. All you can do is prepare your best and and, uh, and lay it all out there. There's, there's uh, I'm sure, people that that have won championships that haven't had to work very hard at it. And 
We've worked very hard and haven't done it, and, and yet I feel a lot of reward out of the effort. A lot of this is about the journey. Well, the journey is over, and time has given us a perspective of 19 incredible seasons. Tonight, we get our chance to say thanks for letting us enjoy the ride. Russell will inbound at half court. Uh -oh. Stockton, open three. Good! John Stockton sends the Utah Jazz to the NBA Finals. John Stockton, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest point guard in history, it's up there, all-time steals leader, 3,265 all-time assist leader, 15,806. He's done it all, and he found time to score 19,711 points. And to honor him tonight with the unveiling going up of his uniform, his number 12, we're going to bring out first his old coach, Frank Layton. Thank you, John. Congratulations to you and your family. Thank you for filling up this building. Thank you for building this building. Thank you for those championship flags. Every one of them, you had something to do with. We hope that your future is very bright, and we hope that God blesses you. And uh, we can't say enough, but let's hope that someday you come back here to us. Frank Lee, thank you. And now we bring up the owner of the Utah Jazz, Larry H. Miller. Well, I've been thinking for weeks about what I'd say tonight. And there's really only one thing on behalf of the fans, behalf of the franchise, behalf of my fam on behalf of my family and myself, thank you, and we love you. New Jersey. Look it out. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the presentation of the Jazz original jersey in Salt Lake and the one that John played in in his last few years. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have the unveiling of the number 12 from up above. And John, uh, I think we're going to bring the cord right down here, and maybe you can grab your kids and get them all in there. Okay, John, first of all, I'm sorry. Take the, take the mic and thank these people, as only you can do. Thank you. We had, we had a small gathering of family and friends last night, and we got together, and I just wanted to thank them for their impact on my life. And I want to include you with that because when number 12 goes up here in a few minutes, I want you all to take pride in it because you all had something to do with it. You came every night.
You cheered, you cheered, you cheered for us every night, and I know I'm, uh, I felt welcome every day I played out here. This is home, and so did my family. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's meet some of John's teammates here. We got a little time. How about Adrian Dantley out of Notre Dame? <laughs> Jeff Hornacek, Horny. <laughs> Thurl, Big T Bailey. And the big fella, Mark Eaton. Second leading scorer in the history of basketball, Stockton to Malone. for on a countdown from Dan Roberts, our P announcer, counting down from five. Here we go, everybody. Let's count it down from five. Five, four, three, two, one. Let her rip. tonight and let's get on with basketball and we thank you for being here tonight thank you so john stockton joins pistol pete frank Layden, mark eaton daryl griffith and jeff hornacek the sixth jersey to hang in the rafters here at the delta center and what a moment it was as we take you to break one more time. John Stockton and number 12. John may be gone from the Delta Center, but his presence will hang in the rafters. We'll be back with the second half of this game in just a moment. <laughs> 